Reflections on writing our CO letters 0 to 14 years ago. What was it like to write this letter and present it to your faith community? Writing my conscientious objector letter was uh, an experience of self-exploration. It prompted me to explore parts of my psyche, parts of, parts of my spirituality that I had not before considered. It helped me a lot uh, in reflecting on what my convictions are, what my feelings about violence and war are. Putting my beliefs into words and giving, giving my beliefs a voice helped me to better understand my conviction in being a conscientious objector. I read the conscientious objector letter that I wrote to in 2006 during meeting for business and the reception that I received was one of respect, one of acceptance, and one of love and and I felt heard, I felt understood. It was very sort of cementing for me, I think. Um, it kind of felt like a culmination of everything that I had been doing as a young friend up until that point. Um, and sort of, as I was sort of graduating and heading off to college, it kind of felt like I was graduating from the friends meeting in a way. Um, and now that I had been sort of supported and bolstered by the, the community, now I was sort of going and standing out on my own with my own conviction. Um, Writing this letter was a really great experience for me. I had a chance to really look into myself and reflect on how I felt about these questions that were primarily focused at the 18-year-old guys that were in my um, youth group at that time. So I think it was a really great opportunity for me to look inside myself and think about my own beliefs, not necessarily just for the sake of stating my conscientious objector status. And from what I remember is uh, other members of the meeting signing this letter. And I think that like as a young adult, um, when you have like the support of a group uh, of people and of your peers and that experience of having my uh, seniors, I guess, sign this letter and commend me for it and recognize it as something important and real was really special. I remember that there was a lot of support from the meeting uh, and, and my friends and family to help me gather my thoughts and help me put them down on paper. And I also remember it was a little nerve-wracking to go in front of a, a large group of people and speak and read this letter, but again, everyone was, was very supportive throughout the whole process. In what ways did this process help crystallize your views about conscious yeah. objection and the peace testimony? I think before writing this letter that I, you know, I, I agreed with the Quaker peace testimony, I agreed with the, va the values of nonviolence, but I think I hadn't really reflected on why we had those values in the meeting or why those were important values to have or how those really connected with the Quaker concept of there's that of God in everyone and how that really was the central uh, hold, the central tenet holding everything together of everyone has this value to them. That Through writing this letter I was able to crystallize my ideas about conscientious objection by figuring out myself and by like I had to sit down and think well why do I want to be a conscientious objector and by doing that I thought well because I'm a pacifist well because I have a moral belief against participating in war um, and so I mean I knew I was a pacifist f since I could define the word but I don't think before I wrote my conscientious objector letter I don't think I necessarily thought about why it helped crystallize my beliefs in that Beforehand, I knew what my beliefs were, but this process really kind of brought it brought it all together and was an avenue to let me talk about it with, with my family, with, my, with people in the meeting and others, and just really was able to help me kind of establish um, a firm 
a firm grasp of all these different parts bringing it together. Did the process of writing this letter change you in any way? I'm not so sure if it changed me as much as it revealed to me what was true for myself. Um, I think that conviction to nonviolence was sort of always present, um, but it just sort of became um, less amorphous and uh, sort of just uh, was cemented there as, yes, this is where I stand. So um, maybe more of a revealing and less of a change. It really impacted me in a way that it helped me to understand, like, as I go through life, what my true feelings are about war and violence and about conscientious objection. And I think that it meant a lot to me later in life to have this letter and be able to go and look back on it. It didn't so much change my ideas in terms of their substance, but it did change the way that I see certain ideas as connected because in the process of writing the letter, I was pushed to really understand why do I believe that nonviolence is possible? Why do I believe that peace is the both most beneficial way for resolving conflict? And that challenged me to not just hold beliefs, but explain why I hold those beliefs. Well, I think that I grew. I feel like I probably grew a lot uh, because I had to think about things that uh, I would just normally didn't think about and just took for granted. I, you know, I had to understand a little bit the greater complexity of this uh, issue. I don't think it changed changed me, but I think it helped me both, as I said before, crystallize kind of what my beliefs are and bring it into one document and. It did give me a sense of this is kind of the path that I want to take and I felt more reassured when talking to other people kind of outside of the meeting who might not be familiar with this process and what a conscientious objector is. Women are not required to register for selective service. Why did you choose to write this letter and come before your faith community? I think that it was something that we were all coming together and doing together and I was the only girl and so I wanted to participate and I was encouraged by my um, youth group leader to participate if I wanted to. So I wrote my own letter and I think that it was an opportunity for me to reflect on a lot of the same things that my peers were going through even if it wasn't like socially, technically something that I would have to face in the near future. I wanted to make a statement and I thought it was important to me personally not participating in a war. I am a pacifist, I have these moral beliefs and because of that I'm a conscious objector and I think everybody should stand for something in, in life. By stating I am a conscious objector I was able to take control of that life and be a powerful female, <laughs> so yeah. I think it's important for women to realize that you don't have to be a man to have an opinion about war and peace. In what ways has this letter framed your thoughts about peace in general and the testimony of peace in particular? Today I'm going to medical school and I think, I mean it wasn't a direct relation to this necessarily, but I, it did kind of put me on a path of thinking about how can I best do something that realizing that what I wanted in my life was something that I felt gave back to everyone and not something like violence that takes away from your community or just the world. It's been a while, but I think the main, uh, the main tenets still stand up. Um, I still believe that um, war doesn't really accomplish anything except start more wars. I also believe that um, killing people is wrong. There's something special about each individual person. And those basically, I guess, are the core, my, two, my core belief, um, how I view, uh, I guess, the peace testimony. I, I wasn't born into a Quaker family. I kind of came into it um, due to my dad's remarrying. And so I kind of came to the Quaker testimonies later um, as opposed to kind of like growing up with them like the Ten Commandments like I guess some people do. So 
that was my first time really exploring the peace testimony specifically. It's it's important to embody and to constantly think about in your day-to-day -day life, not just about a war, but just in your interaction with people. It's helped me realize how how complicated the issue is and how many aspects of my life and the world I feel like peace affects especially thinking of it like I did in my letter from the view of equality and then there's all the connections you can also make connections between what we do to nature but there's I feel like the peace testimony covers so much of our world since you wrote this letter, have your beliefs and convictions changed about conscientious objection? I don't, my beliefs definitely have not changed since this letter. I still strongly believe what I wrote over the last 10 years with what's happened in the world, though. I would want to see more information about what a conscientious objector is and the process and how other people can and seek that process if they want. Um. I think my beliefs about conscience objection have stayed fa fairly the same, but I think one thing that this letter had help, helped start as a process was when I looked at um, those situations and about the selective service and a lot of what they um, market as is being able to serve your country, that, that type of thing, and that's something I don't want to shy away from. I, I definitely am for service and in my whole upbringing doing service trips and that type of thing, it's something that I've found great joy in doing and I continue, continually want to do. And so th that letter helped kind of solidify that um, if I was going to move forward and uh, have service as part of my life, then I needed to figure out other ways to do that. Now that you went through this process, what would you say to others turning 18 and to men who had to register for selective service? Sort of in the same way that sometimes people think Quakers are extinct, sometimes I think people think that conscientious objectors were just something that happened in the Vietnam War. Um, and I think it's an important question in that way for everyone to consider. So spend the time um, learning about what the selective service is, what it means to be a conscientious objector, whether you agree or disagree with it, um, and figure out at least starting a process of understanding where you stand with regard to violence. It's very important that we think about war and we think about nonviolence. All too often it's easy for us to distance ourselves from violence because much of the war we have occurs in distant places, occurs in other countries. I think the process of working on a CO letter can make someone a lot more mindful of that. Well, first of all, I would say that whether you're a man or a woman or whatever your gender identity is, that this is something worth thinking about. Um, certainly for selective service, but just because um, whether or not there ever is a draft or you have to register, is just it's a good thing to think about. Um, and really it should come from what you want to do. Uh, if you look at within yourself and decide that you want to be a CO, this is a very helpful process because you're not told what to think. You're not told how to do this. It's really a chance to think about what your values are and really explore them. It's good to think about when you have that in front of you, what you believe. And I guess I'm not saying to make one decision either way, but to just really think deeply about what you believe and meditate on it and have introspection and then decide based on, based on that what you would like to... what how you would like to approach it. There is no space to write conscious objector uh, on the draft card, or at least there's no checkbox to check, so you have to write it in. Um, and uh, if you're watching this video, you probably are getting all the really useful advice that I could give you. Take registering for selective service very seriously. We have not had a draft for years, and so I like, I know even for me, the only reason I even think about drafts is because I grew up in a Quaker meeting where uh, writing your conscientious objector letter was just often suggested to our teens. Um, but I think a lot of people don't realize what they are doing, that what they're doing when they're signing up for the selective service. And 
just to recognize that not only is it possible that at any time we could have a draft again. Going through this process really makes you dig, dig down and see what your beliefs are and solidify those beliefs so that if you are faced in that situation, if you are faced with that decision, then you have thought about it and it's not something that you have to come up with what your beliefs are at the, a moment's notice. It's something that is, you've thought about for a longer time. What would you say to faith communities considering this process? I would suggest that monthly meetings who have attendees or members who are turning 18, especially young men, provide their attendees and their members with information about what options are available to young people. I think that this process is, is very useful for people, especially those who are around the age of 18 when they're, they're not necessarily very good at expressing their thoughts, very good at understanding what their convictions are and whether they come out wanting to be a conscientious objector or whether they decide that violence is sometimes justifiable they need to be able to have that opportunity to think about it. And I think this process helps, it helped me and I think it would also help people and that's a very good age to start really thinking deeply about what those beliefs are. So it's very helpful to have a, a large group of supportive people behind you. That it's a very important process and I think all men, you know, turning 18 should be, um, should go through should at least be aware of this process and learn what the steps are if they choose to take this because you know at 18 if I hadn't have had the meeting um, giving me this information you know, I don't know if I would have done the same thing or if I would have even known that this was a an, an available option. I wouldn't have known that conscientious objection letters existed if my meeting hadn't mentioned it to me. My parents didn't bring it up very often. My brother wrote one, but it was because the meeting was so persistent in reminding us of verbally and um, through writing, expressing your belief in the peace testimony and expressing your um, belief in nonviolence. And I mean, writing something this personal and speaking in front of an entire meeting and giving them permission to hold on to it for however many years is a big deal. I would recommend the process of writing the conscientious objector letters to any faith community. I have really appreciated the letters that our young people have written. When those letters are read in meeting, that is one of my very favorite meeting for worship with attention to business activities. And the reason for that is it's the an opportunity for young people to really think about what they believe uh, in a very structured process and then to present what they believe to the entire community which is really meaningful not just for the young person but also for the whole community to hear a young person's thoughts and them articulate what it is that they believe it's almost a rite of passage for them when the CO letters are read at our meeting for worship with attention to business. It is always moving to the entire room. I mean, you can just see it. We spend so much time talking about budgets, committees, you know, very mundane kind of things. And there's an energy that these young people bring just by being young people. But when it's in the form of a CO letter, it is an intensely positive energy. It's that that just brings us that hope for the future when we can have a world of peace. One thing is clear. Jesus was a pacifist. So many, many faith communities have a testimony on pacifism. It's just a very practical, real-world way to apply Christian principles. We found that doing it with our young people really helps them to very seriously think about what they really believe and what it means in the world. I was clerk when Sam read his letter and Tom was clerk when Rachel read her letter. 
And I know for a fact that both of my children gave a lot of thought and they took it very seriously. And it, the integrity testimony was important to them that they be writing from a place of what they truly believed and not just stating what Quakers believe, but what they believe. And they were very distinct letters and they were letters that were really uh, them, that really represented them and their beliefs. I am first of all impressed with the maturity of their thinking and I realize that this is a real issue facing the, our young people today as much as it was in my time during the Second World War. I am also impressed uh, with the freeness that they express their deep thoughts. They have written a beautiful statements that I almost couldn't believe could come out of such young and thoughtful people. I think people at 18 are incredibly experienced in the world. I don't think it's too soon at all to think of these issues. We see the evening news and young people uh, need to be involved with shaping the world that they're going to live in. And I liked the the truth-seeking courage which they show, showed, and I realized I was on their side to make a difference, and they were there and doing it. <laughs> I don't think that he would have done this by himself. I think it meant that he had to think very um, seriously about what he believed in, in areas of faith or beliefs um, and values that he hadn't really uh, explored in depth before. Not just thinking about this particular issue, but in seeing himself as an adult with responsibilities to um, his country and to his faith community. And I think that it was a good exercise for him because he realized it was really integrated, not just what he learned in our faith community, but his experience uh, within our family with uh, what his grandfathers and grandmothers went through and how those faiths and beliefs are shaped not just by your family and your culture and your faith community, but the period of time in which you live. Going through this process with my, my son helped me to think about it personally also. Even though I'm not in that point of having to make a decision about it, it really made me reflect on my own personal faith and practices in terms of, of the death penalty or war or community service or patriotism. So it was helpful to me personally as well. We give place in this life for the development of our child, but the spirit of the child needs to be stretched, grown, and for that, having that child be asked to discern what he feels about taking another's life, what he feels about conscientious objection, what he feels about these matters is a piece in a child's life. If we don't ask that question, we don't grow the child. We don't ask ourselves the most crucial question. So for myself, my kid was asked the most important question, and that's why I am profoundly grateful. I think that it's invaluable, and if you're a meeting that finds that the peace testimony is one of your major focuses, I would say that this is a great way of following through with that and um, you're allowing your youth a way to have some sort of um, you know a rite of passage in a way and not just for males also for for females as well that was important so no matter um, what your gender or being able to wrestle with or explore the the peace testimony in a real way um, I think is valuable it is a great process for taking time to stop, think, reflect, um, make a statement, have others to, to hear your statement, and for them to, to also stop, think, and reflect about what you've said and maybe plant a seed in other people's minds as well. 
What has pleased me very much is that originally we did this so that young people would have documentation in case there was a draft and they wanted to make a claim to be a conscientious objector. And we thought it was really important for them to write letters before there's a draft. Should there be a draft, then they could say the draft board, well, three years ago when we didn't have to do this, I wrote a letter. That's pretty sincere. What I have found since is that what it has really done is help nurture the sense of nonviolence and, and respect for all life with our young people. And that that has had a meaningful impact on them since. Uh, doing these post-interview tapes, it's just been so heartwarming to realize that um, this process was valuable to them and has, has had an effect on them and their beliefs and their approach to the world.